Welcome to Solo Only, my Final Fantasy XIV character that can't interact with other players. My goal is simple, get as far as I can in Final Fantasy XIV by myself. No parties with other players or NPCs, no market board, no retainers, and as few NPC purchases as possible. And for as long as we were able to, we would have to use Level Sync or Silence Echo for any instance. Garuda was down and we were in the final stretch of the MSQ. Ultima seemed closer than ever, but with the gear we could craft now, there was no way we'd live the fight, let alone beat it. So before starting back on the main scenario quests, we had some unfinished business to attend to. With the end of A Realm Reborn 2.0 approaching, we would need to have perfect gear to take down the next few dungeons and bosses. And before getting our new warrior gear, we're going to need some new crafting gear, which means the first thing on our list is to take revenge on Zamel Darkhold and progress our grand company. Day 1 begins immediately after the Garuda clear. First is a quick restock of Ochu Vines and Quicksilver to make potent blinding potions. Blinding potions in hand, we turn on level sync and jump into Zamel Darkhold. The first section of Zamel Darkhold is mind-numbingly easy. The Crystal Veil buff means that none of the trash mobs do any damage, and with our improved gear since the last time we were in here, they barely made a dent in my health bar. After opening all the Magitek terminals, it was time for the first boss. The All-Seeing Eye uses Crystal Veil as its main mechanic, so this fight was just as easy as the mobs before. Aside from having to run to new crystals occasionally, there were no issues with this fight, and the boss went down in just about 15 minutes. For the next segment, we used the Hist Strat to try and reach the boss with, uh, varying amounts of success. Not to mention, the boss doesn't even spawn until you reach its room, so it's going great so far. After finally getting the Hist Strat to work, Talad and his goons go down in just about 25 minutes. 65 minutes left on instance, there should be plenty of time to take down Batral. Right before Batral though, there was something odd we found while getting the terminals. While the majority of enemies will stick to the big three aggro types, Sight, Sound, and True Aggro, there was one enemy in here that was a bit different. Though I can't confirm it, the Forsaken Souls seemed to have an aggro type that is very rarely used. While their default is Sound Aggro, they also aggro to any player in their vicinity that takes a decent amount of damage. We'll assume 10-20% to of their health. So while I could avoid fighting a lot of the enemies before Batral, I was almost always forced to fight these two groups. The large crystals next to the terminals would use AoEs that damaged me, which then pulled the attention of the Forsaken Soul next to it. While I'm not completely sure, the only other place I've seen this aggression used is in Eureka, an optional area at the end of Stormblood two expansions after this. Thankfully though, it wasn't much trouble, but they added to the time for these runs and would occasionally cost me some potions. Now it was all about getting past the wall. Batral is the most powerful dungeon boss we've seen to date. In just the first 30 seconds of combat, he used four Grim Fates, each dealing up to 800 damage. We got lucky and dodged the last two, but if we didn't, that would have been 86% of my health gone. As the fourth Grim Fate hits, Batral reaches 90% and the first crystal section starts. Patrol becomes invincible and tethers to one of the three crystals in the room while continuously shooting line AoEs at a target until the tethered crystal is broken. A very basic mechanic for normal players, but for us it's an amazing opportunity. While Patrol is tethered to that crystal, he won't attack with anything aside from the line AoE desolation. Also, there's no time limit. You don't have to kill the crystal for any reason other than to progress the boss fight. So with a bit of fancy footwork, the crystal phases become a much needed opportunity to allow all of our mitigation cooldowns to come back up. With the first crystal phase finished and our mitigations ready to go, the fight only gets harder from here. The first crystal starts between 90 and 88% HP, but the second isn't until 65%. Worst case, we would have to live for twice as long. Every bit of health and mitigation was life or death. It had to be perfect or I lost. Plus, I needed a bit of luck as well to dodge Grim Fates. Home Gang was our most powerful mitigation. Not only did it prevent us from dying, but it locks Patrol in place, preventing him from hitting us with anything outside of his AoE Grim Halo. But as Home Gang ran out, we lost the first pull at 66% falling just short of reaching second crystal phase. After some very intense stealth gameplay, we're back for a second attempt. Home Gang managed to push us over the line and we made it to second crystal phase. From here though, each pull would turn into an endurance test. Home Gang was essential to live the later phases, so we would have to stall for four minutes until it came off cooldown. 
another crystal down, we were just about halfway through the fight. Third crystal phase can begin anywhere between 37 and 35%. Lucky dodges were no longer an option and would end up making or breaking runs. And after stalling out the last crystal, it was time for final phase. Patrol starts the phase with a damage up as if he wasn't doing enough already. And also, the line AoE used during crystal phases will happen periodically, along with dropping a puddle on the ground. Standing in the puddle will deal heavy damage, and he can have up to two on the ground at the same time. Oh, and Grim Fates now deal a thousand damage. Running out of mitigations, the second attempt ends at 11%. It was close, but we had to make a plan for dealing with his insane damage output. Third attempt was lost to back-to-back -back Grim Fates, and after running out of blinding potions, our last attempt for the day ended at 40%. We needed to restock before any more attempts, but it had been a long and exciting day, so this was the end of day one. Day two starts with grinding new potions and food. For now, we were sticking with the same plan. Blinding potions, eft stakes, and lucky dodges. After grabbing our potent blinding potions, next up is some garlic and garlic, fairy apples, black pepper, laurel, and eft tails from mud puppies to get us another serving of eft stakes. With stakes in hand, and a few of the gamers from stream chat stopping by to send me off, we were back in Zaman. And after about 30 minutes, we were back at patrol. We had a whole hour left on instance to grind out attempts. The new day came with new strats to try. In order to phase patrol quicker, I started using the end of crystal phases to get Surging Tempest, Warrior's Damage Buff. It would last for around a minute after the crystal went down, and ideally would help us reach the second and third crystal phases more consistently. The first attempt was incredibly lucky at the beginning. Dodging auto attacks and grim fate back to back, this seemed like our best chance to take down Patrol. Second crystal started at 63%, so the damage buff earlier was definitely paying off, though it still took all of our mitigations to get here. Sadly, our luck didn't last long past second crystal, and we lost at 44%. Immediately after, we had another great chance to clear that ended with the same fate. The desolation gives me a lot of space. I can storm path. Oh, come on. 11% again, man. Uh, what could I have done? Ooh, very unlucky halo. Okay, hello. Auto attack me, please, so you're not doing the halos. Thank you. Oh, okay. I think we're dead here to this now. Unless he chooses to just do the crystal, please. Do the crystal. You're at 66. I hate this boss. <laughs> oh my god. All right. With another round of failed patrol attempts, it was time for plan B. Looks like we're learning to read, gamers. What? What? It, what? <laughs> What? what? Thank, thank you for welcoming me back, I suppose. Right now, a Zamail clear would come down to luck. There are some fights where we've needed to accept that, but never without exploring our options. After some testing on my main, while Warrior would always have difficulties with final phase damage, there was one class that stood out. Turning the fight into even more of an endurance test, Scholar was able to take down Patrol in a whopping 25 minutes using just Bio and keeping out of range of auto attacks. The only way to survive Grim Fates was to keep Adlo up at all times, but it was an option, so long as we could clear the rest of the dungeon. To do this though, we would need Scholar above level 46 and gear at the same level. So with hope in our hearts, we set off to unlock and level Scholar. It all starts with Arcanist. First, we need a level 5 weapon. Copper Sand into Enchanted Copper Ink to make a hard leather grimoire. We use the nearby Hornets and Star Marmots to reach level 5 and throw out the weathered grimoire. Next, we're on to the Hunting Log Grind. Around level 15, things really started to slow down, so we took a break to make another grimoire. Iron sand and tree slugs for viscous secretions to make enchanted iron ink, cotton balls for cotton yarn, and elm logs to make our level 15 grimoire. The arcanist quests gave us a bit of extra XP, and combined with more hunting log, we got all the way to level 27. Fates were taking a long time to complete, so we needed one more grimoire to finish off arcanist. Acidic secretions, yew logs, silver sand, and dew threads to make a goatskin grimoire. While we were making our new grimoire, we ended up right next to Palace of the Dead and figured we might as well give it a try. 16 minutes later, we end up with a very decent 55,000 XP. 600 XP left until we leveled up, we took the chance to kill some random mobs outside Quarry Mill. Now at level 29, we return to Limsa for the next Arcanist quest. One bridge and boat battle later, the Arcanist questline was finished, and finally, Summoner and Scholar were unlocked. 
With Scholar unlocked, we would have to prepare for the long grind to level 46, but before that, it had been a long day, and so comes the end of day 2. Also, you should totally subscribe, I forgot to put this in the script, okay bye. Day 3 starts with the stream overlay, as the proper recordings got corrupted, and our hearts set on reaching floor 50. Palace of the Dead gives more experience depending on which floors you clear. Floor 51 to 60 will give much more experience than 1 to 10. And once I've cleared floor 50 once, I can start from 51 to 60 as many times as I want. Once we have 51 to 60 unlocked, we can start running Palace as a Summoner. Final Fantasy XIV treats Summoner and Scholar as basically the same class. For every time I level my Summoner, Scholar levels with it. Which only gets better since Summoner is one of the best classes for soloing Palace of the Dead. So we make use of my potion save and rush through to take down Ada. The easiest boss in Palace of the Dead down, floors 51 to 60 are unlocked. Our first attempt with Summoner also just so happened to be my first time ever playing Summoner, so we lost to the floor 60 boss. We took that opportunity to get some sustaining potions. Sustaining potions will regenerate my health while they're active, but can only be used in Palace of the Dead. With sustaining potions keeping us at full HP, the floor 60 boss went down a lot easier. For a 30 minute run, we got 115,000 experience, more than an entire level. After a few more runs and a mob surviving what should have been an instant kill, we took a break from Palace. Next on the list was making a set of level 50 crafting gear. Golden fleeces for snurble tufts, caracals for fleece, effervescent water, latex into rubber, electrum ore into electrum ingots, flax into linen yarn, fleece into woolen yarn, effervescent water into natron, and snurble tufts for undyed felt to make a patrician's coat. Then some undyed woolen cloth to make patrician's bottoms, wedge cap, gloves, and garters. We finished our crafter set, and with a bit of luck, Pentamel did our chest piece. And after a full day of work, it was the end of day three. Day four starts, and we're hard focused on leveling our scholar. This'll take about three and a half hours for me, and 15 seconds for you. After a lot of palace grinding, it was time to take a break and collect our spoils. We found a cute little surprise. Oh my god, look at his little face. He's just a little dude. He's a brat. <laughs> and you know what? That's his name. Hello, brat. It's a pleasure to see you. And a piece of replica Allegan gear. Though it was a super cool drop to get, it ended up being relatively useless, then finished off with a Black Bosom Orchestrion roll and a wind-up Eta. It took just under 4 hours, but we got Scholar to level 45, just a bit further to go before Zemeo. Level 45 just so happened to be a good checkpoint to take a break and do some quests. I wouldn't have to do the level 50 Scholar quest for Zemeo, so this would be one step closer to our clear. After a very intense battle with the Tonberry, and visiting the best character in the game, there was just one more Scholar quest to do but that would have to be for another day. It was time to hit the hay and end day four. As day five begins, we get a bit sidetracked. Rather than going back to Palace to finish our Scholar grind, we start by restocking on blinding potions and poison potions. Then, we finally get around to finishing our warrior quests. Now that we had the fancy new warrior armor, it was time for a new glamour. I can't use this armor for dungeons since it's a quest reward, but I can at least glamour it over my current gear. The only problem was my chest piece was only level 49, and it would have to be level 50 for me to use the glamour. Since fashion is the true endgame, we set out to make a new chest piece. Darksteel ore into darksteel nuggets, darksteel nuggets into darksteel plates, cobalt ore into cobalt ingots, and cobalt ingots into cobalt rings to make the first level 50 armor for our warrior, a militia curates. With our glamour finally complete, we could move on and get back to the scholar grind. Except, the militia chest gave me an idea. Militia gear had much better substat coverage, so if I made a full set of militia, I might have good enough stats to clear the mail on my warrior. Level sync will cap our substats, so we wouldn't get any more tenacity or HP, 
but we would get a huge boost in critical hit since we weren't at the cap for that previously. What originally started as a fun distraction for Glamour turned into an epiphany. There was still a chance for us to beat Patrol, though in the usual fashion, we get immediately distracted with the treasure map. One quick map boss later, nothing too useful out of this one. Getting back on track, the first thing we need are some crafter upgrades. Raptor skin and black alumen for leather, iron ore and cobalt ore for cobalt ingots, and some earth shards to make a cobalt file. Some more cobalt ore for ingots, and boar leather to make a new hammer for my blacksmith. We needed these two upgrades so our most important craft would end up high quality. Dark steel ore into nuggets, nuggets into rivets, and some shark oil from our first map to make high quality militia pliers for my armor. After a bit more dark steel and cobalt rings, our the second armor piece is a high quality helmet. For our new pants, we needed a special item called Dodore Leather. Eorzean Database says that there's only one way to get Dodore Leather. The Dodore Wing needed to craft it could be found in Orum Vale. Even if we could get Dodore Leather, we would still need better weaver gear, so before heading into the Vale, Basilisk Eggs into Whetstone, and an Electrum Ingot to make an Electrum Needle. We picked up a new friend from a tree, and got back to work on our new pants. Woolen yarn, silkworm cocoons and water to make silk threads, dark steel rivets, and woolen cloth. We stalled for as long as we could, but the only thing left was Dodore leather, so it was time for Orem Vale. But after a few attempts, we weren't able to get past the first boss, so we needed to look for other options. Thankfully, Eorzean database isn't exactly accurate, and there was one other way for us to get Dodore wings. Leatherworker Leaves and White Brim have a 2% chance to give Dodore wings, and there was an easy one that only needed one Pice skin to complete. Four turn-ins later, we managed to get our Dodore wing lead. And after some quick foreskin moccasins, we had all the items for our pants, plus a level 54 Leatherworker. Dodora leather made, and our militia trousers were finished. Now all that was left were the gloves and boots. Mahogany logs into mahogany lumber, and a mithril ingot to make a new tool for our leather worker, linseed oil, more mithril ingots, and some oak lumber for our final leather worker upgrade. Hippogriff skins into leather, a few dark steel plates, and some cobalt rings to make militia sabatons and militia gauntlets. Our full militia armor made, it was time to attempt patrol. The all-seeing eye, a fight that normally took us 15 minutes to get to and complete, was finished in just 13, followed by beating Tollard about 10 minutes faster than usual. It was clear that the gear was making a difference, and we had a real chance at this. Things were looking good for our first attempt back, but right before third crystal, Patrol took us down. It felt like it was still just barely out of reach, but I still had one last trick up my sleeve. Someone had left a comment on the last video suggesting I check out Aether Truck, another Final Fantasy XIV YouTuber that had some videos on something called Spinning Enemies. Basically, if I could manage to keep a constant circle and stay on the boss's left side, he wouldn't be able to use any abilities and would only auto-attack. I had done a ton of practice for this strat off-stream, but it was incredibly difficult to pull off with my controls. Mouse and keyboard just weren't going to cut it. So I needed a controller's movement, but I had no idea how to play Final Fantasy XIV with a controller. And I didn't have to. I could use the controller in my left hand for my character's movement, and the mouse in my right hand to use abilities. We were multi-control scheme drifting. Even with a controller, I couldn't do it perfectly, but I would at least prevent a few attacks. Two crystals down, I was starting to get the hang of it in dodging Grim Fates. And with the last crystal finished, we were in the final stretch. Yes! No way, dude! Oh my god! <laughs> oh! Oh my god! And so, finally, Zamail was finished, and we were one rank away from our goal. We did it. We did it. Sergeant Only, we've received word of your success. Have these seals along with our congratulations on a job well done. Apply for promotion. I did 800 off. <laughs> Chief Flame Sergeant. Wow, I... I'm still shaking. Now all that's standing between us and our masterwork crafting gear is Orem Vale. Thank you very much for watching. 
The support on these videos continues to blow me away. And I do also read all the comments, so please continue to give me suggestions and ideas. They're all extremely useful for the run. I'll be streaming after this video goes up, so why not jump over and join? Whether you choose to stop by or not, thank you again for watching, and I'll see you next time.